Thank you, David. Um, thank you very much. Okay, so God's been working in my life, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure, I mean, I'm, I've heard from so many of you how God is working in your life, and, um, and I, I want to continue with that. I, I don't want to get to a place where I'm saying I'm satisfied and I'm, I'm good now. You know, I've got everything that I need. I'm good now. I, I don't want to get there. I want to continue to grow in every area of my life. I want to be the best I can be in, in everything that God has given me in my life. I want to be the best husband I can be. I want to be the best father I can be. I want to be the best pastor and leader of this church I can be. I want to be the best friend I can be. And all those things, it requires, um, it, it, the world can give us some advice. But to be lasting and to bring change and the right kind of influence into our children's lives and into our families' lives, the only way possible is if we continue to go to God and say to Him, God, uh, Holy Spirit, first of all, reveal to me. Reveal to me in those areas where I am falling short and where I know I might think that I'm, I'm, I'm the it, um, but I know that you've got more for me. Reveal to me. Show me. Bring people into my life that, I, that can mentor me, that I can look up to, that I, that I can look to and say, man, that's, the kind of, that's what I want in my relationship also. Um, bring people into my life. Bring situations into my life where I can continue to grow um, and, and expand my wisdom, expand my understanding. I want to know more about Jesus, your healing, the way you touch people's lives. I want to know more about how you got to that place where you had 5,000 men following you just because of the message that you were speaking, the insight you were giving into people's lives. I, I want to have that kind of, of, of words in my mouth that when I speak, it impacts people's hearts. And we want to change. I, I want to change for the better in everything. And that's a desire. You know, when we come together on Sunday mornings, um, I had a great meeting with Mark um, two days ago. And we were talking about this church's mission and is to, to what the Bible says. The mission is to create disciples. We want people that are able to go out every single day of their lives and live a, cry, a life that reflects who Christ is. Live a life that reflects the grace, the love, the mercy, the, un the unconditional love that God has for us. We, we want to we create a body where it's not just a Sunday event thing. Where people show up on Sunday mornings and suddenly Sunday, everything is where they get a word and then they leave here and then the rest of the week they fall back into their, their um, pit, whatever they might be in or into their track or whatever they might be on. And then they come back on Sunday, Sundays again and then they feel good on Sundays and the rest of the week they go back in. We, we want to have people that change people's lives. Um, this body, we are supposed to impact the nations wherever we go. We're supposed to bring change into people's lives. And this church will make change, I believe, in this community. And, and in, in many people's lives across the world, I believe we will do that. But we, it's not because of Sunday morning service that's being broadcast. It, the change is going to happen because of you. And that desire and that passion you have to be everything that God has called you to be. Because God's called every single one of us to a place where He wants us to tell the good news to people. God has called every single one of us to live a life where we have that peace of knowing God is with us. I'm going to be okay. And He wants you to share that peace with other people. We want to be a disciple-making church. That's why Sunday mornings is really for us a time where we come together in corporate worship, where we sing together, we lift up God, and we get into the same, um, I want to say, heart's condition of saying, why is my life so awesome? Or, or why, why am I here right now? Why, why? And it's all because of you. Why is my life filled with incredible people? It's all because of you. It's, it's that heart's place where we, we come together, we praise, we thank God, and it's a corporate worship that's happening. During the week is the time when we have our individual worship and prayer time and going to God time. On Sunday mornings, it's us coming together for the purpose of blessing one another. The word fellowship means member to member exchanging life. So whatever we do on Sunday mornings is it's going to be something that I'm exchanging life with somebody else with. I want to exchange life with you this morning with the purpose that you will exchange life with others. Not just for you to keep it to yourself, but for the purpose to take it further than just simply being here. So 
pulse groups is really for us one of those things. I'm gonna, the reason I talk about pulse groups um, so frequently and often is because the reality is your influence um, circle that all of us have, this is what they've studied, this is what the, the clever people know, is they say we have the influence of approximately 12 people in our lives. We can influence 12 people in our lives. Now, that also means that you are under somebody else's influence. And you have to spend at least an hour a week with somebody to have influence in their lives. So you can add up who are the people in your life that you currently have influence over. Think of those who are currently not with God that you are spending time with of at least an hour a week. Start asking God, God, how can I be a disciple for you to those people? Because they are under my influence, and you are the salt. You are the ones that's going to make the difference in their lives. You are the ones that's going to bring the life of God into them. Um, yesterday, we were at a hockey tournament um, with Anjo in Chilliwack, and I was sitting with a dad um, just afterwards. We are kind of having an award ceremony and everything else, and I'm sitting with one of the dads, and he said, my kids hate church. I said, really? He says, yeah, my kids, they, they can't stand going to church. I said, I didn't want to ask him what church they go to because, okay, actually I did because I wanted to be sure not to take ours there, um, but I didn't. I said to him, why do they hate church? He said, for, for the purpose, that it's, it's as if the people leading the church don't have any understanding about how to make something attractive to children that they want to learn more about it. And I said to him, man, yes, our kids ministry, our kids wake us up to go to church. They love it. They, they love the atmosphere of being in a place where, where they are having fun. But during the time of having fun, they're learning more about God. And Jesus is coming into their lives. We're having kids who's giving their life to God at church. I grew up hating church. I don't want that. And he said to me, so, so what's your church like? Do you guys believe in Jesus? I said, of course we believe in Jesus. Uh, he said, and, and just the other stuff, do you like the rest of the Bible? Or do you kind of have your own writings? I said to him, yes, I actually have written two books that you have to go through first. Um, the first one is about personal sacrifice and how to bring um, beating on yourself so that you would be acceptable in front of God. And I saw his eyes getting bigger. And I said, no, <laughs> I said, no I'm joking. I said, we believe in the Bible, everything that the Bible says. And I know different churches have different doctrines regarding the things. But the main thing that we believe is God loves you. God wants to spend time with you. And we don't like to spend time with people we don't like most of the time, us personally. I don't spend time with people. I try. Sometimes I have to. <laughs> you know, sometimes you have to spend time with people that, that you don't normally would want to spend time with. But most of the time, we spend time with somebody who we love, who we like to be close to, who we like to share with. And it's the same with God. God, why? how can I encourage people to spend time with God if they don't even like Him? If you don't even like who He is... So we have to bring that understanding into people's hearts that, that God is a God that's good and He loves you. He wants to spend time with you. He doesn't, and not to spend time with you to go through your day and check where you've messed up. It's, it's not His purpose to spend time with you to tell you where you went wrong. The purpose of spending time with you is telling you that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Man, I've created you awesomely. You're going to do great works for me. Let me work with you through your day. Today, these are the things that I'm going to do through you. You're going to touch somebody's heart. God, how am I going to touch somebody's heart? Well, you're going to be kind to the lady who's serving you coffee. Okay, so what do you want me to say? When you see her, just tell her, you know what? You are awesome. Thank you for the great job that you're doing. Just bless the person. Okay, so where do I go from there? Well, today I'm going to place somebody on your heart that I want you to pray for. And in your thoughts, just carry along with you. God wants to share things with us. But if we're not in that place where I'm open to Him sharing because I think He's distant, it's not going to, that impact's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. So I want you guys to know, please hear me. God loves you. He loves you unconditionally. He wants to share his heart with you. He wants to spend every day with you. He wants to be part of your conversation and things you do. And he wants you to bring an influence and a change into other people's lives. He wants you to impact them. He wants to use you. He wants his body to expand with his love, not with his fear. Is there fear of God? Yes, I think there should be fear of God because He is awesome. He is mighty. He can do anything. But the good news is my dad's on my side. So my fear for my dad is not for the purpose of him crushing me. It is more towards those who don't know him yet. 
Because I don't want them to go to a place one day saying, this person was in my office every single day and I never took the opportunity to share Christ with him. I know that he's missing it. That should be, the judgment's going to happen. We have to understand that. Because it was set in motion in the beginning of creation. It's a word that was spoken. So it's not something that we can ignore or something that's, that we can try to just um, steer away from. Well, I'm just going to kind of be between heaven and earth. No, uh, between heaven and hell. I'm just going to hover in the middle. There's no midway. You're either with God or you are not. And that should be something that captures your heart. Because I don't want my family members and my friends to not be with him. Amen. So we've been looking at giants. There are incredible giants in the word. Um, and by giants, I mean giants of faith, people that we can look up to, people that we can admire, that are people that stepped out in faith, and they did incredible work for God. A man, they, uh, Moses parted the Red Sea. Abraham had a kid at 100. I mean, seriously. Um, you know, he, he had kids then. Um, David, David was incredible. David taught us so much regarding authority. Authority is really becoming something that I'm, it's, it's as if it's opening up more and more for me in my understanding regarding faith. Because faith cannot function without understanding authority. You cannot function in faith without, understand, without understanding that God is our authority. Because then I do things because the authority has said it to me. I might not understand it, but because he's my authority, I respond to what he says. And then out of that, principles are activated that were set in motion in the beginning of time. So, so there's, there's principles in the Word um, that gets activated through my faith because God's my authority. Um, we learned from Noah. Um, and like I said, with Noah, there, there's a few things we could have gone through with Noah. Um, we, we could have gone through the process of don't miss the boat, and we didn't go that one. Um, but we went through the process of understanding one man can make a difference, and you can be that person. You can be the person that makes a difference in somebody else's life, but you have to be willing to say, God, use me. Even when you don't understand it, it doesn't make sense. Um, you're going to get probably a lot of people and resistance people coming against you, but you can make a difference in somebody else's life. And it's until we have that desire to make a difference, to say, God, use me. We are just going to be those people that we, I think we're going to show up in heaven and we're going to be disappointed because it's, I'm going to, I don't want to be that. I, don't, I think I'm anyway going to be it because we still miss it. But I don't want to be the one that's missed everything. You know, at least I want to say, oh, I, was, I got that one right. You know, I did that one. I responded that I missed that one. But I responded there. I want to be that person that has that desire to every single day say, God, I want to make a difference for you. How can I do it? So you can make a difference. Today we're going to look at a man, um, um, Joseph. And um, Joseph is, uh, there's so many messages regarding Joseph that I think that we can teach on. There's so many different, I mean, Joseph, just as the, the, the shadow of Christ is an incredible message, which we're not going to look at this morning. But what we're going to look at is, and I believe this is the advice that Joseph would give us if he had to run a race with us. So it says in Hebrews, the following says, Hebrews 12, 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. So let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. So, so we've, we are surrounded by a crowd of witnesses in this race. Every single one of you. You are currently in a race. Your life is, is a race. And many times in this races in our lives that we are busy with, we get to obstacles and difficulties. And some of, uh, some of you are in those obstacles and difficulties right now. Some of you are at a crossroad with somebody that you might be in relationship with. It feels like you're running in different directions. So we've got these great cloud of witnesses in the stands that we can learn from. Regarding our situations in this race of my life, there's people who I can get advice from. So we looked at Noah, we looked at David, and today we're pulling Joseph from the stands. And this is what I believe Joseph would say to you. Joseph would say to you, don't give up on your dreams. Do not give up on your dreams. Don't give up on your dreams. And I think for many of us, Ermin and I, was, um, Ermin went to a concert last week, um, and uh, she said, she came back and she said, you know what I realized? I think 
I've finally come to the place where I understand that you are too old to go after your dream of singing anymore. I'm saying, why am I too old? She said, because I'm still young, but you too old. Um, looking at the guys who are on stage, you too old, um, but I'm still good. So, I, I, and I said to her, well, you know, I never had a dream for that. It's never been a dream of mine. Um, I've never had a dream, you know, I was, I was in music, but I've never had a dream to become a musician or to record CDs or to be, it was never something that I, I wanted. It's never something I desired, never been a dream of mine. But something that's always been a dream of mine, which seemed hard to get to, was a desire to speak into people's lives. It, it was always a dream because I was struggling with it. Was, was, what, was that thing that seemed unobtainable when I was younger. But that was my dream. That is my dream. So, and I know it's just going to keep growing. It's, gonna see, it's just going to continue to increase. But for every single one of you, no matter where you are at in your life, don't give up on your dream. Your race might be taking you in a different direction, but look at that dream that God's given you in your life. And this morning we can t talk regarding two things. We can speak regarding dreams. What's your dream? Do you have a dream? What's God's dream for you? We're not going to talk about God's dream for you specifically this morning, but, but we will in the future because it's important to dream with God. It is important to have that dream that God places on your heart. It's important to have that in our lives. Some of you already know what it is and you know, man, I've got this dream, but it just doesn't seem a reality, so I've given up on it. I'm too old. I'm too far off in that direction. I've got too many children now. I've, I'm completely in a different career. At whatever it might be that's causing you, God is saying to you, I'm believing this is what we're going to focus on this morning. Don't give up. Don't give up. Because I think many of us have given up. We are just living life. We're just living life for every single day. What's happening is happening. We've given up on our dreams. We, we've given up on pursuing something that actually influences our hearts. We've given up on that pursuit to do something that inspires up and stirs up passion. We've become people that go to work, come home, play with kids, go to bed, go to work, come home, play with kids, go to bed. We've, we've become that routine-based person without passions and dreams. God's saying to us, don't give up. So here's the life of Joseph. Those of you that might, might know Joseph, some of you might not know Joseph. Joseph was the 11th son of Jacob. Jacob um, was the son um, or the grandson of Abraham. So there's, he's got a really good family bloodline going right there. Um, so, so Joseph is the 11th son, and there's one that came after him. And Joseph was the favorite son of his dad. It wasn't intentional, but it happened. And I remember growing up in Sunday school, Joseph was one of the most favorite stories that was told in Sunday school about the brother that had the dreams and the other brothers didn't like him. Um, and then uh, at the Technicolor Dreamcoat musical came out, um, which was songs that I'm sure, oh, if, if you don't know church, you will know. Um, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Is it something? Was it the musical that you guys know here? Yeah? I wore my coat, right? And I closed my eyes, drew back the curtain to see for certain what I thought I knew. Thank you. Um, so, so Joseph is is a story that is. It is a famous story. One of the most important things regarding Joseph that we have to understand is that his brothers did not like him. And um, because they didn't like him, they were scheming against him. So, so Joseph um, was a guy that was unliked, but he was a guy that got a dream from God. And the dream was accurate. It was a correct dream that he received. But he was not liked by his brothers. So this morning, I want to say to you, this message is for every single person whose life isn't going the way you believe God has planned it for you or the way you have planned it. 
This message is for you who feel like your life is going completely in the opposite direction of the dreams that God has given you. This message is for you. This, uh, this message is for you, and, and you've got dreams from God, but it feels like you've completely missed it. You know God's got a plan for your life, but it just doesn't seem like it's happening. Joseph took 23 years to get his dream, his dream to become a reality. 23 years. We give up after 23 days or months, if we really stretch it. Took him 23 years to get to that place with that dream and that passion that he had to become a reality. So are you ready to check out? Some of you are with your dreams. Are you ready to give up on that dream that you had of being in an incredible relationship with your wife or with your husband? Are you ready to give up on your children? Are you ready to check out of life? Are you ready to say, I'm just done with life? I had a different message prepared for this morning. And I felt God told me to change it and prepare, prepare somebody else. Um, I was going to talk on Abraham. And I stopped. And God said, no, I want you to speak because there's people that's given up. And they've given up on things that I know it seems like it might feel like it's going completely in the opposite direction of where, where you were dreaming it would be or of what you dreamed it would be. And God wants to say to you, don't give up. Don't give up on your marriage. It might be completely opposite of what you were dreaming about, but don't give up. Don't give up on on that passion that you have to change people's lives. Maybe those doors feels like they've been shut, bolted, and welded closed. But know that if it's a dream that God's given you, don't give up. He doesn't want you to give up. So Joseph would say to you, don't give up on your dream. So do you know, and, and this is something very interesting. I was at a, at a what, way back, at a pastor's um, conference, probably about four years ago, where the speaker were talking regard, regarding people being discouraged and how people give up on stuff. And he was talking about when he planted his church on some of the stuff that he went through um, as a pastor with his church plant. And he, as he was talking, I went through, man, I went through exactly the same things. And because I remember when we started the church, and some of you were here right in the beginning, our first services were held, the, the chairs were facing that way, because there was a screen at the top, and we didn't have money to buy a screen, so we used the screen at the top, which was really high, um, and we didn't have a sound man, and we didn't have somebody doing the PowerPoint, so the band on stage would have the mixer next to them, doing the sound, and with the other hand, you... you press the button for the words, hoping that it, it's, you know, people are following with you. And at times we'd be singing different songs to the slide that would be on. And you'd see the people's expressions saying, are they you singing the wrong words or we're singing the wrong words? Because something is not clicking up. I remember also we shifted after that. We moved the church to face that way. That way. And then to be really creative because we only had, I think at that point, 16 chairs. We asked people to join us for our service, but they have to bring their own chair. That's how we started. People had to bring their own sun chairs, you know, those nice fold-out ones. It's really comfortable. And we were sitting in the sanctuary with the band on that side, people bringing their chairs at night. Um, and it, it was a night service. And, and it was, we had to set everything up, break everything down, set everything up, break everything down. And, and there weren't a lot of people involved with the church right then. It was only a few of us that was really doing the work at times. And, and I remember going home at night saying, God, do you really want me to do this? Because this does not, seriously, I mean, who wants to do this for the rest of his life? I, just to ask people to bring their own chairs already felt like, uh, I remember when I sent the email out, I was thinking, are you seriously putting this in the email? Bring your own chair. Um, uh, and you go through those thoughts of saying, I, I, I don't know if it's worth pursuing it. And the other things, I remember we came in here because we didn't know how the schedule worked with the school. The heat wasn't turned on. So the one time you come in, it was freezing cold. Everybody's freezing. And they're like, because this room without heat is really cold. And the next time, everybody comes with ski gear, and then the heat's on. And then everybody's sweating again. Um, and... You know, and it was, and then there's, because there's no sound band, and you're busy talking, and you walk in one direction, and suddenly the microphone goes, 
<laughs> and everybody's looking at somebody who's going to fix that, but nobody can because the mixer is behind me on stage. And it was hard, right? And you go through these things saying, man, I, you just want to, there's enough churches that can do this. Why do you do this? Because God's given us a dream to have a body that will influence people to become disciples to change the nations. God has given us that dream. So we can choose to give up because things get hard, or we continue to go on. And we chose to go on, and, and it's still, we still face stuff. We still face things on a weekly basis that we have to struggle and work through. But every single time that comes up, I am reminded of the things that God has done in our lives and what He has done in this body already and in the lives of the people in this body. And then I'm encouraged to just say, we'll keep going on because God is busy doing the work. Do you know that 90, this is a stat, 90% of all the pastors across the world, if you would ask them if they still want to be a pastor, they say no. The only reason they are doing it is because of the finances. They will not have any other way to earn a living. Do you know that 95% of them do not, have any, do not have any close friends to talk to? 95% of past, you know, thank God I'm not one of those. But honestly, I love what I'm doing. This is a dream for me that I'm busy working with, with God. I'm thankful that we've got close friends. I th I'm thankful that our body is not just a body of, of where we dread seeing the people, but I love seeing the people, meeting new people, going out with friends, having relationships that's being built up and stirred up and strengthened and seeing new relationships formed between other people. But understand this, even pastors struggle. I know you struggle also. And I think sometimes it might be even harder for you to follow your dreams. It might be a dream for a business that you think, man, this is just going to take off. Everything's going to go just fantastic. If God's inspired your heart for something specific regarding business, don't give up. Work hard at it. Keep going. Okay, so Genesis 37.5. Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. Uh, so, <laughs> okay. So, what, what did they do? They hated him. It wasn't full stop. And Joseph told his dream to his brothers, and they hated him. No. They hated him even more. They already did not like this dude. They, they did not like their brother. Why? Because he was his dad's favorite. He got the coat. So, they hated him even more. So, this is the dream that, <laughs> that he told them. And this wasn't... It wasn't the wisest thing to do, uh, but it, I mean, either he was maybe just oblivious of their feelings towards him. So he said, so, so here it is. Here's the dream, guys. Listen to this. Please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There we were, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And indeed, your sheaves, they just stood all around and bowed down to my sheep, to which their brothers go, well, praise God, that's just fantastic. Um, that's just, that just, Joseph, thank you so much for sharing. That just blessed my heart. That's, that's awesome. Thank you very much. No, they did not do that. They already hated him. And then he shares the dream with them where they're all going to be buying down to him. So now what do they want to do? They want to kill him. Let's cut his throat. Let's throw him to the animals. Let's destroy him. Let's get rid of him. So they want to get rid of Joseph now because now what's happened is he sold them the dream. And now, you know what? This dream was a real dream. This wasn't a, something that he, in his spare time at night, was thinking about and saying, you know, this, this would be a cool dream. Um, he didn't in the day, he wasn't in the day busy cutting sheaves. And that's why he was dreaming about sheaves at night. It wasn't something that just popped into his. He had a dream from God that was an original dream. It was a real dream. But it took him 23 years. He had the dream when he was 17. And it became a reality when he was. Woo! How old was he? Say it like you mean it. 40. Yeah. Woo! Thank you very much. 
It's amazing. Yvonne spoke to me earlier, and, and we said, you know what? Your life really, everything else you've been doing, it makes sense when you're 40. No, it's, it's as if, you know, you've been busy building. There's been bu- building blocks. And it, it's like, it just feels like, for me in my own personal life, it really feels like God is saying it's starting. So 40, David, uh, Joseph's dream became a reality when he was 40. Fantastic age. So this is, this is what happened. Then they said to one another, look, this dreamer is coming. Come, therefore, let us kill him and cast him into some pit, and we will say, Some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. They were thinking, okay, so let's see how your dreams become. Let's see how the sheaves bow down when you're dead. And then what happened is he got sold into slavery. It wasn't just, listen, uh, thankfully his younger brother was there to talk some sense into them. He wasn't just sold or, or, or It wasn't just like, okay, let's get rid of that. He was sold into slavery. He went from the place of dreaming the dream to exactly the opposite direction. Or that's what it felt like. Because no longer was he in the presence of the ones that was going to bow down to him. So here's four things that I think it's going to help you regarding your dreams. The first thing that we're going to look at, the first thing is, um, and okay, so I I, want to say this. Part of my job is to take things in the Word that seems complicated and hard to understand to try and make it simple, to try and make it something that we can comprehend. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to put the cookies on the bottom shelf so that everybody can reach it. I want everybody to be able to take from it, no matter where you are at. Now, now, there'll be some light moments in the message. But this is a serious message because I know somebody's giving up on life and God doesn't want you to give up on life. God wants you to live. God wants you to to be inspired with your dreams again. You might be in completely the opposite direction of the dream that you've had. Okay, so here's the first thing that I believe Joseph would say to you. He says the following. Don't give up on your dream, even if it didn't start off so well. Don't give up just because it didn't start off so well. Because most of the time when we get a dream, what happens? We immediately start pursuing it, right? We just jump into it. Right? We're just going to do this thing. And, you know, we, uh, no matter. and then what happens is we get into to the church and we have to set up tables and chairs and, and sound and everything. And, and you think everybody's going to come. You know why? Because I'm going to share the gospel, man. The whole ladder is going to show up. You know, you're super excited. Everybody wants to hear the good news. Or you have a conference or you do something, you know, and whatever you might be busy with. And then who shows up? The four people who help you to set up the chairs. And you think, man, this, I'm sure God placed this in my heart. And for some other reason, the only person who's here and excited about it is the four that we hear already. So it doesn't feel like it's starting off. Because most of us, the dream is the end result. And for, for that process to take place, we don't dream the beginning. Because I think most of us will not pursue the dream if we see the whole journey. Can you imagine dreaming the dream? You know, like, and like, I'm going to do what? I'm not going to do that. You know? I'm not going to, um, you know, go pick vegetables at 4 o'clock in the morning in the rain because I can't earn money. That's crazy. Who's gonna, who wants to do that? Oh, God, this dream is so awesome. I'm going to work my nails off. I can't wait. Oh, thank you for sharing. <laughs> we don't get that. What, what do we have? We see the end result. But the journey sometimes and not sometimes. If, if you, let's say, if you are at a good place in your life right now, you don't need to hear this message of don't give up. I want you to take notes. Because somewhere along the line, you are at a place where you want to give up. And I know you're saying, Andreas, can't you be more positive? I am positive that somewhere along the line, you are going to have, get to that place where you feel, I want to give up. 
I'm positive. Because it happens, it happens, it happens. We do get discouraged. We do get tired. We do, it does feel like, man, you know, my, I'm serving in church and I'm just making, not so, oh, I just said just, just making coffee is the wrong word to use because making coffee is a big thing. Luckily, Shana's not here right now. Or I'm, I'm just greeting people at the door. I, you know, or I'm just, I'm taking the poles out in the morning, which Murray does every single Sunday morning at seven o'clock, goes out and pushes poles into the ground to show people where the church is. I'm just doing that. My life has to be more than that. I want you to encourage you and say, you know, this is part of the journey of our ministry of the dreams that God has for us. It's not going to just be the platform ministry. What character is being formed to get you to that place where that dream becomes a reality? Don't give up because it doesn't start off as you thought it would. So um, some of us are still plagued, not by the potential that God has for us, but we're also plagued by our resume of the past. I have found that many people, when they give their lives to the Lord, they get very exciting, excited, you know. They get like they want to change everybody's lives. They want to tell their friends and their family members, and everybody has to come to Jesus. You know, and they show up at the, at the dinner table, the family Easter dinner or Christmas dinner, and the only believer there, and they try to convert people in the prayer for the meal, uh, for the turkey. Lord, I just pray that um, all those who are not saved will raise their hands right now before we dish out the turkey. Uh, you know, and you try to convert people, and you get so excited, and, and what happens is we, we get discouraged because what happens? We lose our friends and our family members out of our eagerness to share the good news. Many times we get abandoned by those who we want to share the news with because we don't have the understanding on how to share it yet. We're not sure how to disciple yet. We're not sure how to influence their lives yet. So we just start sharing stuff with them. And for most of them, it sounds like, first of all, you're speaking a language that I don't understand. What does saved, like salvation mean? Like salvation or, you know, words that, have you been baptized? Like for some of them are thinking, oh, this is, I don't know if I want to be baptized. Have you drank the blood and eat the body yet? What? I don't want to drink blood and eat body. <laughs> you know? yeah, we, we use these terms that don't make a whole lot of sense. And we get, our, it's almost like the enemy comes in with rapid fire during that time because he wants to discourage you to get you back to the place where you look at your past and think this, what's behind me, what I've done is causing me not to move forward. And it's always going to be there because people are always going to remember what I've done in the, in the past. So we keep looking in the rear view mirror. And this is the thing about the enemy. And, and, and to me, it's like it's breaking open more and more. The enemy, the devil is the originator of what? Rebellion, right? What's the first thing he did in heaven? He didn't lie to God. He rebelled. Okay, it's the first thing the enemy did is he rebelled. He's the originator of rebellion. So what does rebellion do? It says, I go against the word that you speak. I'm going to oppose that word. I'm going to stand against it. So what happens is when, the, when, the, when God says to us, listen, guys, you are forgiven. God says to every single one of you, your sins are forgiven. And he says in his word, I remember them. No more. So if I remember them no more, what would that mean? It's forgotten, right? If God says, I don't remember them anymore, they're forgiven, you are washed clean, I remember your sins no more. So, so then what does the enemy do? He comes and oppose exactly the words that God speaks to you by bringing in the opposite. So he brings rebellion into our heart regarding what God says to us in our spirit. In our spirit, the Holy Spirit says to you, you're forgiven. Rebellion comes in and says, I have to do more to be forgiven. Because I really can't just be forgiven because I've asked God to forgive me. I have to do something. 
There's something more that needs to happen for me to be really be forgiven. So the enemy keeps reminding us of the rearview mirror. He keeps reminding us of our mistakes, of our past, of the things that we've done wrong. And many times it comes in those moments where we feel, I've had a dream for God. I'm going to do something for Him. No, I'm not equipped. Oh, I just, man, those are the areas where I failed. It's exactly there where I failed. How on earth am I going to make a difference in somebody else's life? I first have to go through a process. I, think I can't just go and start with this dream that God's given me. And the enemy comes and he says to you, no, you're worthless. It's not going to happen. You're a sinner. How can you be such a hypocrite and go and tell other people how they should live when you are a hypocrite? You're a sinner yourself. Look at what you've done in your past. So what he does is he immediately cripples us with the rebellion that comes into our hearts. And this is the choice that we constantly have. We either have to submit to God's words that he's spoken over us, or we submit to the enemy that's trying to keep us in rebellion by thinking of our past. Am I saying that we just forget everything that we've done in the past and we move forward? No, I believe we learn from our mistakes. A hundred percent sure of that. But it's not supposed to hold us back to moving to where God wants us to be. Okay, so the devil is the originator of rebellion. and rebels against what God has done for you. And he whispers in your ear, don't believe God whenever he says anything about you. He rebels against what God has done. He will try to keep you focused on your yesterday. Always try to keep you focused on your yesterday. There's a joke. Can I tell a joke? If you've been in this church, um, as long as we've been going, you might have heard this joke. Like, my, the well is not deep on jokes, okay? Um, so we're going to, there'll be some repeats. But, but, and you probably, you might have heard it somewhere else. But if you have, because it's my birthday, it's really nice if you would laugh anyway. Small token of your appreciation. So, there's this guy, he walks into a pet shop, and there's a parrot in the corner. And he's kind of looking around at the fish and everything else. And the parrot says, hey, hey, you, come here. And the guy kind of looks around and says, me? He says, yes, come here. He doesn't have a finger, though, but that's what he, if he had one. He's got a little claw thing, and he says, come here. And he says, yes, and he stands in front of the parrot, and the parrot says, you're ugly. And the guy looks around, and he calls the owner over, and he says, listen, your parrot just told me that I'm ugly. And the owner takes his hand, and he hits him on the snout, no, beak. Otherwise, it would have been a dog. So um, he hits him on his beak, and he says, don't say that again. And the guy leaves, and about a month later, the guy comes back to the pet shop again, and he's by the fish again. And the parrot says, hey, you, come here. And the guy walks over to the parrot, and he says, yes. He says, you know what? <laughs> so, for those of you that don't get it, the, he said it the first time, and he's not going to repeat it again because he don't want to be hit. So, anyway, but it's very funny. Come on, that's good stuff right there. Thank you very much. I'll be here the whole week. Um, uh, thank you, Laura. Is it Christina just explained it to you? I can see it. There. Lawrence, come here. <laughs> you know what. <laughs> so, so here's the thing. I, I want to I wanna label the, the devil as the you know what guy. He's the, he is the you know what of your of your of your life because he is the one that will say to you you know why you don't qualify you know what you're never going to make this and you know why because i'll remind you of your past i'll remind you of what you are in right now how on, how are you going to change this you can't change this this has been your life for 17 years you, there's no way that you can go back you know what? God is saying to you, don't give up on your dreams. Even if it doesn't start off the way that you wanted it to start off. Don't give up because it's not where you think it should be right now. It might take time. But if we stick with God, our dreams will become a reality. Okay, so this is um, what Paul felt also. Paul, Paul had a terrible 
terrible past. He killed, crucified, um, martyred, stoned Christians. He probably had the worst resume of anybody to qualify to become what he became. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. And his past was one where he was the killer of Christians. No matter what your past is, don't listen to what the enemy is saying to you regarding your past. Continually go to God. Get that connection where God speaks to you so that you can get into that place where you can move forward to where he wants you to go. Um, this, is, this is what he says in First Timothy 1. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. Even though I, once, I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. So how did he strengthen me? Paul said, he considered me faithful. Stay faithful to your dreams. Don't give up on it. Second thing, don't give up even if those closest to you are not supporting you. Don't give up even when those closest to you are not supporting you. That's happened in many lives here. It might be the one that you've got the dream for that's opposing you. It might be the one that you have the dream to connect with that's opposing you. Marriages, don't give up. The opposition many times comes from the one that you are married to. Don't give up on your dream. You will have opposition. It's one of those things. Why? Because the enemy do not want God's dreams for our lives to become a reality. So, Jesus experienced rejection from his own family in his own town. Mark 6, 33. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, Only in his hometown, amongst his relatives, and in his own house is a prophet without honor. Jesus, in his own hometown where he grew up, was rejected, and he said he can only do a few miracles there. You are going to experience rejection in this journey. You know, most of the time, we would love our journey to be just from A to B, dream. And, and we, it would be so f amazing. But most of the time, it is A, go up a little bit, need to pit a little bit, go back to A, go forward a little bit, go up. And, and it's that whole process of not giving up on our dreams, which we must hang on to. Jesus had that same experience of rejection from those who knew him. Don't give up on your dreams, even when your journey is full of surprises. If you get a dream from God for your own life, it never goes from point A to B in a straight line. It actually goes zigzag a little bit. Last week, I received a lot of um, just incredible testimonies from people in the body that emailed me and shared with me some of the rejection they experienced when they were in school, when they were going through it also. Many people experienced many emotional, where it's almost like people were pushing them down, trying to keep them from rising to become what, what you're supposed to be. And what you will find, and, and you might recognize this, people give advice where they have no clue what they're talking about. Have you ever had advice from people that have absolutely no idea what they're talking about? Like, you've got no idea what I'm talking about. No, I went through the same thing. No, you did not. You went through something completely opposite. It's not even close to the same situation. Yes, but I can imagine what you're going through. You, you can imagine anything. Like, you don't say that. But that's, you know, and you get, and why is it? Like, I've, I've got people who's called into ministry. I know people. It's called into ministry in a specific area. And then what do friends do? They rather want to hold them back. Because they're scared of losing the friendship. You rather want to keep the person back from his dream and his calling because I'm scared I'm going to lose your friendship. This is why I feel like I'm out of control. So I give advice that's contrary to what I believe God has given instruction for. We give advice and counsel because we are uncomfortable with the situation. I'm uncomfortable with your dream, so I'm going to advise you against it because I am uncomfortable with it. Not because it's God's will or not God's will. It's simply because this is how I feel about it. Be cautious with where you get 
your advice from. Make sure that you are around people that will encourage you, build you up, lift you up, and strengthen you. Be cautious with Facebook. You know how many, yes, I can tell you, how many stuff I've written on Facebook to people, I want to say dumb stuff that they put on there. On, so somebody writes something amazing about a journey that God's taken them on. And, and, and then you get some, uh, idiot's not a nice word to use in church, but it is very accurate. <laughs> so it's only when it's accurate are you allowed to use it. Um, <laughs> Then you get somebody that responds to just deflate this person's dream. They, it's as if they just want to take a knife and let's just, you know, it's, I feel it's my responsibility to pop your bubble. I'm just going to stab at you as much as I possibly can. It's the, do not, ex, unless you are so strong and you feel that you are at a place where you can answer every single one of the nonsense stuff that they write back to you, um, don't expose yourself to it. Share your dreams with people that will look after it and nurture it and encourage you to pursue it. Because if you throw your pearls in front of the pigs, what do they do? They step all over it. Don't throw it there. Be wise in what you put out. Like I said, I've, I've responded and I thought, no, you know what's going to happen is if I respond to this dude right now, he, then I'm going to then I'm going to be called into conversations that's going to take my time that I don't want to get into and then I just backspace 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 be wise with who you share what people are going to pull you down now we're almost done 5 minutes is that okay okay so yes yes joseph life joseph's life 10 points that you can see the first thing about joseph is what he was misunderstood by his family well i say misunderstood but they probably understood him they just didn't like it you're going to bow down to me. What does that mean? No, uh, it was, you're going to bow down to me. Um, so he was misunderstood by his family. The second thing that happened to him, after that, he was sold into slavery to Potiphar. After that, he was living in a strange country away from home. After that, he was given favor in Potiphar's house. After that, he was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, saying that Joseph is pursuing me. Meanwhile, she tried to rape him. After that, he was thrown into prison. After that, he was put in charge of all the prison. Then, he was forgotten by the chief cupbearer. After that, he remained in prison for two years longer. After he interpreted the guy's dream that he's going to be promoted. And he said to the guy, remember me when you get out to make sure that you mention my name so I can get out also. For sure, I'm going to do that. Two years later, oh my goodness, I think I just remembered something. <laughs> There's a guy in prison who I said I will remember. Um, after that... He interpreted Pharaoh's dream, and after that, he became second in command. Now, I, I want you to look at this, and uh, this is your response. I want you to either say, give up or go on. Okay, so this is your response. Give up or go on. So, misunderstood by his family. No, how would you feel? Do most people, I, don't, I know we want to be really encouraging right here, but most people would do what? Okay, let me, let me explain this to you. So, Give up. What would most people do? Not, not us Christianese people. Um, give up or go on. Okay, ready. So, misunderstood by his family. What do most of us do when our family don't understand when we are pursuing God's dreams for our lives? Don't talk to me. We give up. Second thing, sold into slavery. What? Give up. Okay, so you have to vocalize it. Tell me, what would you do? Give up. Okay. Next one. Living in a strange country far from home. Okay. And this is not Rotary Traveling Club, right? This is in slavery, away from your family and friends. They've rejected you. You've been sold in slavery. So where, what, what would most people do? Give up, right? Given favor and part of his house. Go on. Good. Okay. Next one. Falsely accused by his wife. Give up. When you're a man of integrity, she says, sleep with me. You say, no, I don't want to sleep with you. Then what she do? She tells her husband, you told he wants to sleep with me. He's trying to take advantage of me. What would most of us do? Give up. Okay. Next one. Thrown into prison. Give up. In your life, you're thrown into situations where you are bound, shackled, and chained. What would we do? But give up. Right? Next one. 
put in charge of all prisoners. Okay, so we've lost momentum completely. You have to say, give up or go on. Okay, so put in charge of all in the prison. Good. Okay, forgotten by the chief cupbearer. Give up. Right. Remained in prison for two years. Give up. Focus. Um, interpreted Pharaoh's dream. Go on. Then become second in command. Go on. After 23 years, there were double the amounts of times that he could have given up than there were that he would go on. We have to decide, even in the midst of those times when we want to give up, to say, I'm going to go on. It might not feel like it. It might not be the feeling that you're getting right now that I want to, give, uh, that I want to go on. But don't give up. Okay. Um, last one. Don't give up on your dreams, even if it takes a long time to become a reality. This is my advice to you. This is what Habakkuk says. I love, 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 love this verse. But it's not like I love this verse that I want to put it on my fridge. Um, I love this verse because it is so true. Listen to it. It says the following. These things I plan won't happen right away. Like, yeah, let's print that out. Let's put it on the fridge. That's awesome. It's going to motivate me every morning. The things I plan is not going to happen right away. No. Slowly, steadily, and surely. Like that. Three words that we don't like to use in the modern world. Slowly, steadily, and surely. The time approaches when the vision will be fulfilled. If it seems slow, do not despair. For these things will, come, will surely come to pass. Just be patient. They will not be overdue a single day. That's awesome. Slowly, steadily, surely. If you don't give up and you have a vision and a dream, no matter what the area is in your life, know that God will produce it. Just stay on the track. Don't give up. Don't give up. Okay, I'm going to finish. Um, because I see there's a lot of kids at the back. Um, I'm going to finish with this. And this is advice that I really believe is valuable. And this is for all of us in our journeys. Most of us focus on what's happening to us instead of what's happening in us. And we have to understand this concept. What's happening to you is something that is completely um, it's almost like if the enemy can get us focused on the things that's happening to us, then he will distract us to get to that place where we grow to the things that's happening in us. If you can learn this lesson, the longer you take to focus on what's happening in you, the longer you take to get to that place where you understand it and you grow it and you get it, that's how long things are going to happen to you. You are the one that's going to determine how long it's going to be. You are the one that's going to make that decision. God is working character inside of us, and what we are going through is what He is using to facilitate that. You have a role to play in how fast it goes, depending on how fast you learn. We are not focusing on what, what is happening in us because we are so focused on what's happening to us. God wants us to focus what's on happening in us. So for your dream to become a reality, David is saying to you the following. Don't give up on your dreams. Don't give up. In the midst of your struggles where you are right now, every, no matter what area of your life it is, this is God's advice to you. Um, do not focus on the situations. Focus on what's happening inside of you. Deal with the inside. The inside will influence the outside. If you have anger issues, deal with the, in, if it's influencing, like if you have these, these 
explosive um, arguments with your wife or with your children or, or at work. Those are the outside situations. God, what are you dealing with me? If you're telling me that I'm going to be somebody that's going to minister to people's hearts and needs and things like that, I can't see it right now. So what do you want me to do? Let's deal with the inside. What needs to happen on the inside? God, I need to deal with my anger issues. What is my anger issue? My anger issue is I want to control everybody else around me. I have to deal with that. I have to deal with the anger that I have because I want to control people. Because they're not doing things the way I want them to do. They're not responding the way I want them to respond. They're not saying things the way I want them to say. So I have to control my response to that. It's something that has to happen on the inside. If I get to that place of understanding the root is me, I have to change. What will happen is the outside situations will start changing. The quicker you focus on the inside problem, the quicker the outside situations will change. Focus on what God's doing on the inside. Don't give up on your dreams. Focus on what God is doing inside of you. You would love, we would all love it to be A to B or A to Z or whatever the, the, your target might be. We'd all love it to be it's just a straight line. But there are detours. And during these detours, God is building character in you. He's pouring character in you. Allow that character to be formed. Allow it to be formed. God is not the one that brings the disasters into your life, but God can build character through it. And he can turn disasters into testimonies. There will be difficulty in your walk. There there is, because it says so in the word. It says the winds and the waves and the storms will come. It doesn't say that we are excluded from them. It says, but we will stand. Why? Because I've got my foundation on Christ. My character is strong. Don't give up on your dreams. Amen. Amen. Um, Let's pray. Father, thank you that you are good. And I thank you that you've got a, a specific purpose and plan for every single individual here. Thank you, Father, that you've given us dreams in so many areas of our lives. Father, I pray for kingdom filled dreams. I pray for dreams that will consume our hearts with 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 a, a grip, Father, that we will become passionate about the dreams that you have for our lives. And not just our own um, little selfish kingdom dreams, Father, but the dreams that you have, that you've given us instructions in your word, the dreams that we have regarding our marriages, to be strong, firmly planted in you, where husbands honor wives, where, where Father, where we are parenting together, where we are in spirit, one in unity, where, Father, we are faithful, where we are trustworthy, Father, where we walk with integrity, where we lay down our lives 100% for one another. Our Father, that's a dream for every marriage. And I pray, Father, that the people that's here this morning, that at the point where they want to give up on Lord, God, I pray that you will inspire them to go on. Go on even if there's difficulty and it feels like you're running back and forth, go on, do not give up on your dreams. And during this time, focus on what God is doing inside of you right now. Allow God to make the change in you. If the change is not happening in the other person yet, that's okay. Because you are not told to be in control of the other person. You are told to be in control of you. So God, bring the change in me. Uh, Everybody just pray that with me. God, bring the change in me. Bring the change in me so that you will form the character of Christ in my life. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I thank you for every believer that's here this morning. I thank you for the hearts that know you. I also want to say this morning, if if you are at a place where you don't know Jesus yet, you've never made a decision to say that I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. God, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. You've never said, Jesus... I accept you as my Lord and Savior. If you want to make that decision this morning, all I want you to do is just to raise your hand and say, yes, I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. If you've never done that before, and you can take your hand down again. Fantastic. You know what? It is so important for me to give that opportunity to people. It is so important for me to do that. Last week, we had two new believers give their lives to the Lord. We praise God for that. This morning, if you're still on a journey, I'm going to encourage you to keep going. Keep going. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. After the service, we're going to have... um